the truth, and that I would have the power that I need to present your word. It is in your Son, Jesus Christ's name, and we do pray. Amen. Now, there is a funny story that I heard once about a pastor who was dealing with an inclement Sunday and was wondering who was going to show up. And, and one farmer came to the church. And so the, the pastor went to the farm and says, you know, you're the only one here, so I really don't know what I'm going to do. And he says, you know something, sir, if there's uh, you know, just one cow in the stall, I don't stop milking, I go when I milk that cow. And so therefore he says, okay, well, then now the pastor comes up and he gives a very impassioned sermon, sermon and spends the 45 minutes he usually um, get, gives, and then he goes to the farm, well, what do you think? Well, you know, a pastor, that if I just have one cow and try to get all the milk from that one cow, that it would from the others. <laughs> and so, and so I'll try to find the balance of, of giving you something this, this morning, but if we, and at least on time, if not a little early, that might be okay as well. I think when we are thinking about the book of Deuteronomy, any Old Testament book, we have to remember uh, that uh, the Bible does tell us that these things are written for our example, uh, the things that the Israelites went through, what it teaches us about human nature, what it te teaches us about God, is, is still valuable in spite of maybe the things that we might not quite connect to historically or in terms of law. But again, we'll work through that in, in terms of just our, our going through it. So if you can turn to Deuteronomy chapter 2, we kind of did work our way through chapter 1 last time. Really, one through four, effectively in the, I'm sorry, one through three in, in, in uh, the book of Deuteronomy, is really Moses looking back so the people of Israel can move forward. It's looking back so that Israel can move forward. And that's really the point of what's happening and what we are in the midst of here. And so we see in terms of the wanderings in the desert, uh, basically what this teaches us in terms, again, we're not going to read through uh, each Portion because again I think I can summarize it effectively. I do I do encourage you even to read it. And if there's something you feel like you, I missed, something that can kind of hits you, the same well, I can't believe you didn't mention this verse or whatever. Um, and so when we talk about Deuteronomy two uh, chapter two, if you go to the next slide, uh, Kevin, uh, really two one through thirty three uh, teaches us giving respect to family. I mean, basically, as the Israelites are going to the promised land and will eventually defeat uh, nations, they will overtake land and conquer in Christ's name, or in God's name at least, um, when it came to family members, when it came to those people they were confronting on their way to the promised land, God said, don't, don't, don't mess with them, don't bother them, um, and basically that is the Edomites. Now, the Edomites were descendants of... Esau, and so therefore that's Jacob's brother, so giving honor to that. And then, um, and, that, and actually, again, when, when, I, when you see a reference to numbers, that, that is something that I have a more complete message on in terms of the significance of that. Um, and so if you want to reference that um, in, in terms of what is, would be on the website, feel free to do that. Uh, but then in, on, uh, in, in the section of, in this passage in Deuteronomy, uh, the Moabites also, the old Moabites and the Ammonites actually are mentioned as far as, again, don't mess with these people. And do we know who the Moabites and the Ammonites were descendants of? They were Lot's descendants, and so that was Abraham's nephew. So, again, respect for family. You know, when we understand that God has established a family as the main building block of society, you know, in some ways, you know, there's, when we think about our lives, is. Besides God's work and what he provides for us, as far as earthly things, family relationships are some of the most significant things that God has provided for us and desires for us to work our, his will out in. And so when we think about just what the nature of our family relationships are, how passionately we should be pursuing reconciliation, uh, good relationship, harmony, uh, forgiveness, understanding, uh, uh, admitting faults, the different things that... God allows us in terms of having good relationships, pressing that into family, and just recognizing that we're in the family that we're in or have been, not by accident, but by the plan of God. That that's one of the sovereign things that God decides. And so therefore, when we're there, we know that God has a plan and a purpose. God has a plan and a purpose for that um, in, in, in terms of what he, would, what he would intend. So 
again, as, as the Israelites are, are told, to respect family, respect those connections. I mean, even family that has become evil. You know, these descendants of, of Esau, these de descendants of Lot, they weren't righteous people. They weren't doing things right. They weren't following God, but they're still family. And so, therefore, there has to be regard uh, for that. Now, is it is interesting as they move on from there. Well, let me just read uh, 2.14. Because it is interesting in 2.14, this is Moses summarizing the wanderings in the desert in one verse. Kind of interesting in terms of what that says. That 38 years passed from the time we left Kadesh Barnea until we crossed in Zered Valley. By then they had that entire generation of fighting men had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. The Lord's hand was against them until he had completely eliminated them from the camp. And we saw last week, and we might even know from what we know of Scripture, that was because of the fact that this that generation had been brought to the promised land. God had shown them so many powerful things in terms of how he would get them through and, and how he would give them victory over the people there. But they gave in to fear and in their own insecurity. Because of that, God said, well, you're not fit to enter the promised land. But to, to, to see that Moses summarizes that time frame in just one verse shows really what his focus is. His focus isn't that time of disobedience. It's not focus of, of all the murmuring and complaining that happened on that trip, but really what had God, done, God had done around that, what the Israelites had done in response to God, and what God is doing beyond that in terms of this generation of believers, or the, this generation of Israelites is more fitting uh, to say. Uh, from there, in terms of just recognizing those wanderings and the cautions as far as not dealing with the Moabites and the Ammonites. Then he goes into the defeat of Sihon and Og at the end of chapter 2 and into the beginning of chapter 3. And so it is interesting that Sihon was a walled city and Og was a giant. Now when we think about what the Israelites were afraid of, well, we can't go into that promised land because the cities are strong, the walls are, are, are high, and so therefore we can't, we can't defeat that. We don't see anything in our capacity and our, our power to overcome that, so that's why they gave into that fear. They were also said there were giants in the land, right? Well, look at, um, what, is, what, what is that verse? In, in verse 11 in chapter 3, it says here, Only Og, king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of the Rephaelites, his bed was made of iron and was more than 13 feet long and 6 feet wide. It is still in Reba of the Ammonites. And so again, this was a big guy. And so therefore, the, and, and the, this clan or this people that is, that is mentioned here as far as the Rephaites, again, they must have been known for being large people. And so here, and this is this new generation, by the way, that is defeating it's Sihon and, and Og that's overcoming these peoples. And so they're overcoming the very thing that the older generations with, was threatened by. And you think about, um, again, just the, just the significance of that in terms of, again, the faith that they, that, that they had. Um, to, to, to recognize that in God bringing them through, well, I, I'm trying to think of what I was going to say and now I'm remembering it. We have to, something that else is important to, to, to note here is that as they were traveling past these nations, they actually were willing to pass peacefully. But it was the king of Sihon and it was Og that came out and, and battled against them. So it wasn't the Israelites that initiated battle towards them, but once battle came to them, then God used that to defeat these nations. And what's significant about that is that God was preparing them. Your God was preparing them for the battles they ultimately would fight. And so what we have to recognize, that's often, that's often what God does. You know, I think everything that we go through in God's economy, everything we go and go through in God's will, really every circumstance of life is an opportunity to glorify God. And every circumstance of life is something God is trying to work through, instruct in, uh, build us up in our relationship with Him and our dependence on Christ through and so when we recognize the significance that is in each moment, it's true to say that there is significance there. But we also have to recognize that every moment is also a preparation for something that is greater or could be greater, something that God is preparing us for. 
I mean, as, as, the, as the Israelites, this new generation of Israelites, following Moses again, they got to that point where the old Israelites were. Now they've crossed and they're there before they get ultimately to the promised land. And they confront these two nations. Now they're battling, they're fighting. And there's significance there. You know, there's threat in terms of danger that they, that they confront. But they're engaging in those battles. They're learning warfare. They're learning how to use the sword and the shield and all the different elements of that. And yet, what is God preparing them for? So significant to that moment, but the God is also preparing them for the time where this generation of Israelites would then take over the promised land and defeat many of the Canaanite nations. And so, again, that's the way, that's often the way that God works, and you know, again, something we learn in the context of this. Another thing that happened in chapter, chapter 3, in terms of the next slide, we do see the division of the land. Again, that is something that happened in Numbers 32 as well. It's the dividing of the land on the east side of the Jordan. You know, realize that certain tribes decided to have land on the east side of the Jordan rather than the west side of the Jordan. Um, that was the Reubenites, it was Gad, and it was the Man a half, half tribe of Manasseh that was on the east side of the Jordan. Um, now, the agreement that was uh, brokered with them, though, is because of the fact that it was all the people of Israel who were supposed to defeat all of the promised land and take over that land, that the fighting men of these, of these tribes agreed that they would still join the Israelites on the other side of the Jordan. So again, the, 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 the comradeship, the identification with family, the participation, that, that when we think about... Uh, our own efforts and what we would engage in, you know, just because something isn't personally, there's not personal investment on our part, like something we may be doing as a church, well, I'm not affected by that, I'm not benefited by that, why am I going to participate? Well, I mean, just think about these Reubenites, think about these Gadites, think about this half-tribe of Manasseh. We, we've got our land, we're, we're established here. God has fulfilled this promise to us. And so what business is it of ours, what happens on the other side of the Jordan? And God says, well, you know something? Because you're family, because you're together, because you're one unit in terms of the people of Israel, yes, you are 12 tribes, but you're also my people, and you're fulfilling my promise, a covenant that I've made with the whole people of Israel in terms of the land that I promised them. And he really, going back to that time, it's the promise that he gave to Abraham, that if you're going from Ur and you're tra traveling to the promised land, everywhere you step, Again, that is the promise. That's the covenant promise of God in terms of what he's going uh, to provide. And so, uh, but that's again what's covered in 12 through um, uh, 20 in chapter 3 of, uh, um, of, of Deuteronomy. Now, 21 through 29 is talking about Moses being denied access uh, to the promised land. If you don't remember the story... Um, it's about getting water from rocks. Um, again, there were two times that uh, the Israelites got water from rocks. Well, the first time, Moses was instructed to strike the rock, and miraculously, you know, just imagine a rock in the desert and no water around. Where do you, you know, you think about the power of God, the influence of God. He can make water come from anywhere. He can make provision come out of anywhere in terms of what we need. So. You need water? Well, I can make it come from a rock. Think about, uh, you know, what, what, like, I don't think there's a worse uh, place to turn for water. You know, if he said, like, dig a hole in the ground, that might make physical sense. That might make, oh, well, eventually it will get, no, but striking a rock, getting water out of a rock, no, that's not, but that's what happened. Now, the next time that God, the Israelites were seeking for water, Moses was told to talk to the rock, but out of anger and frustration, he struck the rock rather than talking to it. And the consequence for that is he would not enter the promised land. Now, this engagement between him and God here is pretty interesting. So I will read this in terms of Moses pressing God in terms of changing his decision. And so it says in verse 21 of chapter 3, At that time I commanded Joshua, You have seen with your own eyes all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. The Lord will do the same to all the kingdoms over them over there where you were going. See that preparation? Uh, do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God himself will fight for you. 
At that time, I pleaded with the Lord. This is God. This is Moses again. He's retreading, going back so he can move forward. At that time, I pleaded with the Lord. O oh, sovereign Lord, you've begun to show to your servant your greatness and your strong hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do the deeds and mighty works you do? Let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that fine hill country in Lebanon. But because of you, he's talking to the Israelites now, the Lord was angry with me and would not listen to me. That is enough, the Lord said. Do not speak to me any more about this. Go up to the top of Pisgah and look west and north and south and east. Look at the land with your own eyes since you are not going to cross this Jordan. But commission Joshua and encourage and strengthen him for all, for he will lead this people across and will cause them to inherit the, the land that you will see. So we stayed in the valley of near Beth Peor. You know, we have other instances in the Bible where people didn't like what God was doing and they tried to engage in conversation with him. You know, uh, Abraham was pretty, you know, a good example of that. Remember that? When again, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, God, what if there's a hundred good people there? I'm not sure what number he starts at. But, but what if there's a hundred people? Oh, what if there's fifty people? What if there's forty people? What if there's ten, ten righteous people? Would you say, yes, I will. That I intended to do it, but you know something? If you can find ten righteous people, then I will, I will not bring the judgment that I intend for Sodom. So there's an example of God caring what people, as someone said, and changing his direction. I think he knew there weren't ten, so he you never know, you know, truly changed that, that direction. But that's the kind of God we have. He, he's open to conversation. I mean, notice even how, I mean, this is a pattern of prayer throughout Scripture, Moses says things to try to convince him. You know, I, I know how mighty you are. Maybe in that, I know how wrong I was to defy you, to do something different. And so can I please go over? And yet, what does God say? No. Not only no, don't talk to me about this anymore. In other words, you, you have your consequence. That this, this is, again, leadership, with leadership comes responsibility. That you can't mess with what I say. And the minute you give an example to the people that it's okay for you to defy God or change the direction. Again, I think it's more about who Moses is and the responsibility he had. But we just have to realize that, you know, God is firm, but he's also kind. He's firm, but he's also understanding. And so as we engage with God, just understand, we shouldn't be surprised by either answer. You know, when all of a sudden you're, you're pressing God's throne and you're having that conversation and your prayer life, you're, you're honoring him and asking for, them, th for things. You're, you're saying, maybe I don't like the circumstance I'm in. Can you change this? Will you overcome? Will you do this? And sometimes God will just say, no. I want to support you in this. I, I want to give you provision to help you withstand this rather than overcoming this or taking this away from you. Now, it is interesting. I think it is an expression of his grace in a sense that he says, I'll let you look at the land. I'll let you see, again, where you brought the people of Israel to in terms of fulfilling that promise. But again, no, you, you don't do that. And that's where 